Coming up, kid approved. I'm really excited to be able to hang out with my friends now. The nation's top health agencies, the CDC and FDA, give the green light for kids aged 12 to 15 years old to get the Pfizer vaccine for the coronavirus. Will kids get the same vaccines as adults? We'll answer your questions. Also had pipelines. What exactly are they and why are they so important? Details ahead. Then rainbow science. Just how do rainbows form? We'll explain. Plus shark adventure. We'll head out with some junior scientists to learn more about these fish. And these two besties are finally doing something many of us can't wait to do. Their inspiring story just ahead. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's always great to be with you guys. We've got a super lineup today from sharks and a really unique and fun race to an 11 year old from North Carolina who is a champion at, get this, stacking cups. My best time for the 3 3 3, which is the easiest stack, and which is nine cups, is 1.7 seconds. She's going to put me to the test a bit later on. Also, this teenager is stirring up a storm in Chicago. His inspiring story is just ahead. But first, our top story continues to be the road to recovery. As we just mentioned this week, both the FDA and CDC gave the OK for kids 12 to 15 years old to get the Pfizer vaccine for COVID. Experts say the vaccinations are the best shot for a safe return to school, to summer camp and for sleepovers. 13-year-old Caleb Chung took part in the vaccine trial. I'm really feeling hopeful and optimistic that I can maybe hopefully get back to normal. Well, we always know you guys have questions, so let's get straight to them. Joining us now is our pal, Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, our first question is about the vaccine for kids. Take a listen. My name is Shiv. And my name is Chris. We live in Boston, Massachusetts. And we have a question. Will kids get the same vaccines as adults? Bye. We love Nightly News Kids Edition. Yeah, Dr. John, that's a great question. Is it the same stuff that we got? You know, this is a wonderful question. And right now, the one that just got authorized by the FDA is the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. And it's gonna be the same dose at the same time periods, meaning they need two vaccines three weeks apart that adults get. But what we don't know is for children that are younger or for the other types of vaccines, if they're gonna be getting the same dose, if they're gonna be getting it the same times as adults get it. That's what the trials are trying to find out. And they have children who are volunteering right now to get the vaccine. And once they get the vaccine, we'll find out what dose they need and how often they need it. So we'll know soon, but as for the one that's authorized, authorized right now, it's the same as adults. And Dr. John, for kids and parents who are watching, are there any safety concerns about the vaccine for kids? And Lester, that's a fantastic question. To help me answer that question, I want to bring in America's doctor, the U.S. Surgeon General, a good friend of mine, Dr. Vivek Murthy. Dr. Murthy, what do you think? Well, hi, John. It's good to see you, and it's good to see you, Lester. I'm so excited to have a chance to talk to kids today. What I'd say is that if the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, has said that it's safe, if the Centers for Disease Control, that's another important group of scientists in the government, the CDC, says that it's safe and effective, uh, then those are scientists that we can trust. And it's always important to talk to your doctor uh, to, you know, before you make a big decision like this and to get all the answers to the questions that you have. And it gives us a way to protect ourselves and stay safe. And that's something I know that we all want. Well, we've got a couple more questions from our viewers just for you, Dr. Murthy. This question is from Mary in Idaho. Here it is. Hi, it's Mary from Idaho. What does the Surgeon General do? Well, it's a plain question, Dr. Murthy. Well, hi, Mary. It's Thanks for your question. Well, the Surgeon General is a doctor who's responsible for helping people to stay healthy and for giving them information and tips and other tools to prevent themselves from getting sick. But I'll tell you something that a lot of people don't know about the Surgeon General. The Surgeon General doesn't actually have to be a surgeon. I'm actually an internal medicine doctor. And the Surgeon General also isn't a general. The Surgeon General is an admiral, specifically a vice admiral in the United States Public Health Service. Thanks for your question, Mary. I just learned a lot there, doctor. Our next one is from two of our regular viewers. Take a listen. How does someone get to be the Surgeon General? What does the Surgeon General do? Why is this job important? So we know what the Surgeon General does now, but what about these other questions of 
who can be a Surgeon General and how do you get the job? Uh, well, here's how you get to be the Surgeon General. So the President of the United States has to ask you uh, to serve in that position. And it's up to the President, really. The President might pick somebody who's uh, done a lot of research in their lives, and or they may, he may pick somebody who knows how to communicate well with the public, or maybe somebody who's done all of those things and has been a great doctor during their lives. But it's, it's really up to the, the President of the United States to pick. And the good news, though, is that anyone can be Surgeon General. There have been men who are Surgeon General and women who are Surgeon Generals. There have been people who, of all different races and ethnic backgrounds, who have served as Surgeon General before. What really matters most to be Surgeon General is you just have to want to serve the public, help people to stay healthy, and you have to be guided uh, by science in everything that you say. I'm sure it's an amazing honor to serve in that role. Dr. Murthy and Dr. John Torres, thank you so much. Great to have both of you with us today. Thanks so much. Good to be with you. What do you say we turn to another story making headlines this week, and that's gasoline prices and fears there could be a shortage after a cyber attack on a critical pipeline here in the United States. You may have heard your parents talking about this, and it got us thinking, what exactly is this kind of a pipeline? Here is our friend Kristen Dahlgren with more on that. This week, grown-ups scrambled to fill up their cars with gas in parts of the country. After a vital fuel pipeline stretching 5,500 miles from Texas to New Jersey remained largely shut down. Why? A group of bad guys hacked into the pipeline's control system last week and demanded a fee to restore access. The cyber attack didn't spread to the critical systems, but it caused some big headaches for many Americans, especially those who live in the southeastern part of the country. Check out the line. The Colonial Pipeline provides the eastern United States with nearly half of its fuel for transportation by ground and air. It is absolutely something we use it's what fuels how we get around. The attack caused gas prices to go up and also left some gas stations without any fuel. So that means mom and dad may not be able to get to work or drive you to grandma's house. This comes just a couple weeks before Memorial Day, which is usually the unofficial start of summer and when many families like to hit the road for some fun. Did you know the oil used to heat homes and businesses, the water used for drinking and taking a shower or bath, and the gasoline used for cars are all made available by way of pipelines. One of the first pipelines ever built was designed to carry water. Pipelines are lines of pipe equipped with pumps, valves, and other devices and are used to transport materials rapidly, like carrying water to farms for use in irrigation. Today, gasoline is used in cars, trucks, motorcycles, boats, and construction equipment. Airlines also use gasoline for planes. It helps you to get to school, the park, your friend's house, and even vacation. You might not think about gas every day, but it's certainly an important part of our lives. It's also how important things are transported. Next time you go to the grocery store, look around. How do you think all that food got there? The paper towels, the produce, it was trucks that brought it there. Those trucks need diesel. Where do they get that diesel? From the gas station. That gas station gets its gas from the pipeline. And that pipeline we're talking about is the biggest in the country. The Colonial Pipeline was able to restart the system this week. It's not just a flip of a switch. It's gonna take some time for it to be fully restored. So gas could still be in short supply for some time, with just weeks until all those summer road trips get started. All right, Kristen, thank you. Well, with springtime comes more sunlight but also more rain. And when the two combine, a really, really cool thing we often see in the sky forms. And here to explain just how rainbows form is our friend and meteorologist, Dylan Dreyer. Hey, Dylan. Hey, Lester. You know, rainbows are one of the prettiest optical illusions to happen in nature, and they really only take two ingredients, sun and rain. It might seem weird to have sun and rain at the same time, but it certainly does happen. Now, one thing you need to know is that white light is made up of all the colors in the rainbow. You know, the red, orange, yellow, green, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And when you have that white sunlight and it comes in contact with the raindrop, it actually, the raindrop causes that white light to scatter in all different directions. And then it reflects on the back side of the raindrop into our eyes, just like a mirror. And when this happens on a huge scale, like when there are millions of raindrops in the sky, we end up seeing that huge rainbow that we know and love. Now, here's a little secret. If it's sunny by you, but not raining, just grab a garden hose, spray it into the sunlight, and I promise you, you can make your own rainbow at home. But Lester, I can't promise that there'll be gold 
at the end of the rainbow. I love the idea of an at-home rainbow. <laughs> I was driving in California recently. It was, it was just what you described, the sun and the rain. And it was the first time I can recall seeing beginning to the end, the entire arc it is, it it's is special cool. when you have that unobstructed view. Now, if we didn't have the horizon, you'd actually see the whole circle because a rainbow would actually make a whole circle, but the horizon cuts it in half. Oh, I'm only seeing half. Okay, I'll yes. stop bragging about seeing the full <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> Maybe right. one day. Dylan, thanks. <laughs> now we go from rainbows to sharks. How about that for a switch? We're going to head to Florida where our pal Carrie Sanders caught up with a group of junior scientists who were studying sharks and tracking their movements electronically and have uncovered a unique race. Carrie, tell us about it. Lester, I'm gonna challenge you to a race. Who can run the greatest distance? But this race is gonna be a little different. It begins offshore. We're in the Atlantic Ocean, a mile off the Fort Lauderdale, Florida coast. We're gonna be looking for some sharks. On the right? hunt so, for sharks um, with a biologist from Nova Southeastern University. We are gonna catch them, but we wanna make sure we do it in a way that's gonna leave them as happy and healthy when they go away from the boat as we possibly can. How this all ties into a race between Lester and me will become clear after we first meet our junior scientists. I feel pretty confident about having this fish in my hand. Um, I believe we're gonna catch a shark. Eighth graders Imani Harley. Let's go. All right, wait going in. Anthony Rubio like and Lindsey Perrin. Right. Each thrilled that class today is not like all the other classes during the pandemic. Now we're out in the open and we get to interact with all the different people and it makes it more exciting. So we'll kind of push us in. Baiting hooks. Nice big throw out in the water. Perfect. Tossing lines, all with the goal to catch, tag, and then release sharks. The hooks they're using are engineered for this research. They're called circle hooks. So it won't hurt the shark? It won't hurt the shark, exactly. Okay, let's get back to our unusual race. Did you know whale sharks are the largest fish in the world? Meet two whale sharks. Gentlemen. One named Lester. Take your marks. And the other named Carrie. Set. And the race is on. Because both Shark Lester and Shark Carry have electronic tags, you can follow online to see who travels the greatest distance and wins. Here's the link, but we'll show it to you again, so get ready to write it down or snap a photo with your phone. Feed the line out. I'm dreaming of pursuing a career in biochemistry, so this is something I can look forward to. All right, so we've got a great hammerhead shark here. Our eighth grade scientists in training first caught a hammerhead. Did you know this shark's name comes from the unusual shape of its head? Tag number 468. Eight feet, two inches long, estimated weight 250 pounds. How do you feel about this? Uh, it's surreal to actually be sitting here because I've never been this close to one. So it's awesome. After 10 minutes, Go boy. the hammerhead back free. It was surreal because I'd always seen like hammerhead sharks and stuff on like TV. But now I finally saw one in real life. When I saw its fin in the distance, it was like beautiful. Did you get scared as you got closer? No, I, was, like, I felt like really relaxed and calm. You got it? Not long after, a lemon shark is on the line. Did you know the lemon shark is the most researched of all sharks? How did it get its name? Because of its unusual yellow-brown skin color. Seven feet, nine inches long, 200 pounds. This one also tagged. And if you're wondering, do those tags in the fin hurt the sharks? It's kind of the equivalent of getting your ear pierced or... or... So with the, the sharks are not feeling pain? No, no. Every year or so, scientists discover a new type of shark, and not all are dangerous. The whale shark certainly isn't. They don't attack people. No, no, not at all. So whale sharks, they actually eat very tiny microscopic thing called phytoplankton. <sighs> okay, Lester, let me stop and catch my breath. See this website here? Okay, folks can go to that website and they can see Team Kerry, Team Lester, and find out who's winning. And those whale sharks' transmitters will continue to send out signals for the next two years. So, Lester, we got a long race ahead of us. Back to you.
Okay, Kerry, thanks, and sorry, but I hope my shark wins the race. Time now for our pop quiz where we put you to the test. Today is Armed Forces Day, which honors those who serve in all branches of the U.S. military. So my question is, which of these is not a branch of the military? Is it A, Army, B, Coast Guard, C, Police, D, Air Force? We'll have the answer after a break. Just ahead, what happens when friends online finally meet? Plus, Speed Stacker, this 11-year-old has mastered the art of stacking cups. She'll be here to show off her skills. And inspiring kids, this high school student is juggling schoolwork and a job. But get this, he's the boss. We'll explain. Now let's get the answer to our pop quiz. Which of these is not a branch of the military? Is it Army, Coast Guard, Police, Air Force? The answer is C, police. Police are not part of the military. The U.S. military has six branches of service, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, and Space Force. What started as a pandemic pastime has turned into a passion for Jayla Brothers. Over the past year, the 11-year-old has become a cup-stacking champion, a talent that's led her to the U.S. Junior Olympics team. And joining us now from North Carolina is Jayla Brothers. It's great to see you. I love you've got the stack over your head right now. Thank you. T yes, really high. Amazing. Tell me, what, what got you started doing this? In fourth grade, my PE teacher, Miss Lisa, had brought them out to teach us. And I thought to myself, this is so cool and different. And I guess here I am. And, and it's uh, it's all about speed, right? That's the key? Yes. Yeah. Speed is the the key, the lock, everything. All right. We're going to look at that in a minute. But you're on the junior Olympic yes. team. What is your goal? Yes. My goal at the junior Olympics is to take out my competition and get bring home more medals. <laughs> All right, take it out of the competition. Well, you're going to show me how to do this right now. I'm going to watch you, and I'll, I will, yeah. I'm going to be real perfectly honest. The stack right here in, on the desk in front of me was done by one of our stage hands, and it took him about three minutes. So <laughs> tell me, <laughs> show me what you do. Okay, so first we're going to start off with the 3-3-3. Three, three, three. That's the easiest stack there is. So you're going to start off when you're going to go down, up, down, up, down, up. Then you're going to go back to the beginning. Down, up, down, up, down, up. Wait a minute. So so I go, so I got them here like this, right? And yeah. then, so one more time. You're so, going to need nine of them. Nine so of them. I don't go, know how many I got here. I'm just yeah. going to, so, so you do that. Okay, so you go, yeah. Got up. And then you're going to go down, up. <laughs> I'm just going to watch you. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than embarrass myself. So, can... but you, you're doing that slow for us right now. Can you show me at, at the speed you would do it in a competition? Yeah, try to go like this. Oh, come on. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's faster. <laughs> it's faster. I'll just have people bring me cups. Yeah. Um, so, what's your, what's, your, what's your best time? My best time for the 33, which is the easiest stack, and which is nine cups, is 1.7 seconds. And oh my, my record for the cycle, which is 12 cups, which is the hardest stack, is 6.3 seconds. Ah, the 12 cup challenge. I know all about that one. Any tips that you can offer kids <laughs> yeah. who are watching and even adults like me? Because I am going to try this at home. Yes. I would advise all the kids or even parents that are watching to practice, 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 because practice makes perfect. And you should start with easier stacks and, like, gauge into it as, like, faster and more you practice, and you can check out my YouTube Speed Stacker Jayla because I posted tutorials on there. Ah, uh, you are amazing! What a great little hobby to pick yeah. up, and you're making so much of it in, in in a competitive world. Jayla Brothers, fun talking to you. Thanks for being on Kids Edition. Thank you. All right, I'll get back to these cups in a little bit, but I want to get to Chicago right now, where we want to introduce you to one kid who not only is working hard in school like you, but he's also running his own restaurant. How about that? Our friend Kevin Tibbles has details. Stirring up a storm in Chicago. What do you do? I am a restaurant owner. I go to school, balance everything in one. <laughs> and what a balancing act it is. Jonathan Macedo is just 18 years old. Okay, muchísimas gracias. 
He's a high school senior and the owner of Peque's Pozole Restaurant, where they ladle up bowls of hot and spicy soup and other Mexican specialties. Wow, you must be a busy guy. Yes, very busy. <laughs> So what's pozole for those who've never tried? Pozole, it's a soup that is cooked with pork and corn, and it's a traditional Mexican dish. The restaurant is named after Jonathan's mom, whose nickname is Peque. She started selling her popular pozole from the family's home kitchen before they opened up shop with Jonathan in charge. Oh, great. I'm glad you enjoyed the food. Today, Peke is keeping an eye on things and says she's very proud of her busy son. Pues yo me siento muy orgullosa de él. After all, Jonathan still has to go to school. And he's a good student. Just ask his teacher, Dania Atta. The fact that he has straight A's and is running a successful business is just mind-boggling to me because most adults can't even juggle two things at once like that. So he's wonderful overall. He's even received a scholarship to attend business school. Quite an achievement. People love this? Yeah, a lot. But getting Peke's Pozole up and running was not easy. Yeah, I was here with my mom the whole time and stick through it together and it was, feels great being able to have about 13 employees now and it having it run by itself, technically. And the customers, they're a very satisfied bunch. Best Pozole in Chicago. You should try it. All right, kid, I'm gonna take you up on that. My first taste of pozzoli. Delicioso. So what's Jonathan's dream for the future? Well, more Peque's pozzoli, of course. I have such so strong feelings towards the business because my mom is the one who started it with her hard work and I just wanna continue that for her. I know it will make her proud to eventually see our business grow into multiple locations, maybe into multiple states one day in the future. You want to be a Pozzoli king? Yes, all over the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> but first, Jonathan, after stirring the soup, Mom wants you to finish your homework. Finally, in our Inspiring Kids series, doesn't matter how old you are, the kind of real meeting you're about to see is something a lot of folks have been dreaming about. It's the 21st century equivalent of a pen pal. I'm not hosting. First graders Julia and Luna met online during virtual school, and they became fast friends. For six months, the girls chatted online. Julia, look at my new shoes. Then, as a birthday surprise for Julia, Luna surprised her in the local park. <laughs> Tell me what that was like when you when you first saw Luna. Oh, I was so excited. And then we ran and we hugged and my mom let it slide through. <laughs> Julia and me, like, we're running and we yelled and we both yelled our each other's names. Like Luna! Yola! <laughs> now the girls are back in school, and to say they are inseparable is an understatement. Tell me what friendship means to you. Friendship means something personal and keeping secrets and good at hugging and always cheering you up and being there. Friendship is what <laughs> friends do because if someone gets in trouble, I'll take the, I'll, I'll blame myself that I did it. Bye. And now they chat like never before, showing there are no barriers to true friendship. Some boys and girls still aren't back in school and they're still studying online right now. Do you have any advice for them to make it a little bit easier? Even though that you're still online, you can still have friends. Yeah. Those besties cracked me up. I loved talking with them. Well, that's going to do it for us parents. Just a reminder, if your child has a question about anything in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram. Also, just a program note, you can catch a new episode of Nightly News Kids Edition every Thursday on NBCNews.com and YouTube. Thanks for watching, everyone, and remember, take care of yourself and each other.